Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of Renaissance Radio with our usual guest, Paul Kersey, to talk about what was really a very momentous week, but I suspect we'll be having many, many momentous weeks uh, in the weeks to come. I think one of the most interesting things that happened was, of course, the appointment of Steve Bannon of Breitbart News as Senior Policy Advisor to the new incoming president. Now, the job of senior policy advisor, a lot of interesting people have held this. This is not a ceremonial, po uh, ceremonial post on the Democratic side. People such as David Axelrod, uh, George Stephanopoulos, Sidney Blumenthal, and of course, Valerie Jarrett, who is there right now, really doing uh, what she no doubt thinks is the Lord's work. And on the Republican side, Karl Rove for George W. Bush. He was senior policy advisor. So this is a really a significant and important post. Jared, a lot of conservatives were worried that uh, did Donald Trump renege on his promises by making Rents Priebus the chief of staff. However, on that same day, it was announced that uh, Mr. Bannon, who has really read to, led to a renaissance of Breitbart. I mean, when, Breitbart, when Breitbart's creator, Andrew Breitbart, died, people were worried what was going to happen. Well, Bannon has taken that enterprise, that operation, and arguably made it into the most must-read conservative right-of-center site on the Internet. And this, this couldn't be more exciting for um, understanding where Trump is really headed. I mean, we just saw the announcement yesterday that if you go to work for Trump, you have to pledge that for five years you won't lobby. You won't be a lobbyist. He is draining the swamp. And having Steve Bannon in place, I mean... Valerie Jarrett has been the person who's been instrumental in making sure Black Lives Matter has access to the White House. She's the one who, you know, you go and you look at all these times, all the, uh, the shocking number of times that Obama has entertained these people in the White House, the Oval Office. That's the position Steve Bannon is in now. And, and just like our conversation last week, Jared, Steve Bannon is an American nationalist. He is not under any under any uh, imagination of the term white nationalist, which I never actually liked that term, by the way. I've always hated that term because in reality, you and I are American nationalists as well. But Steve Bannon's appointment as senior policy advisor is, in my opinion, the most exciting news to come out of the post-Trump victory. I agree. And when the twin announcements of uh, Reince Priebus as chief of staff and uh, uh, Bannon as senior policy advisor, my view was, OK, Bannon can be the ideas man <laughs> and let let this apparatchik, let this Republican apparatchik carry out the policies. I think if they work together in that way, to me, that is the ideal team. But we'll see what happens. Of course, and now I agree with you 100%. The idea that Steve Bannon is some sort of frothing white supremacist or anti-Semite, this is nuts. But that has not stopped Democrats and other crazy people from the following sorts of comments. Harry Reid. He says the appointment of Steve Bannon, quote, places a champion of white supremacists a step away from the Oval Office. The ADL says it's a sad day when a man who presided over the premier website of the alt-right, a loose-knit group of white nationalists and unabashed anti-Semites and racists, is slated to be a senior staff member. And Glenn Beck, <laughs> what did he call What did he say about uh, well, Glenn Beck has been on a crusade as of late, but he said, I believe this was on uh, Anderson Cooper's CNN when he was basically crying, he said that Steve Bannon is, quote, a terrifying man, unquote. A terrifying <laughs> man? Well, I'm glad to hear that Glenn Beck is quaking in his booties. And then Esquire's Charles Pierce, this is a pretty well-known journalist, he tweeted on Sunday night, shortly afterward, after the appointment, he says, let us be clear, the hiring of Steve Bannon as a White House policy advisor is exactly the same as hiring David Duke. Now, a guy who does not know the difference between David Duke and Stephen Bannon, I'm sorry, this guy, don't pardon me, he don't know shit from Shinola. This, this is just pathetic. This is libel. This is seriously libel. And one of the stories we're seeing is that Breitbart is getting serious about suing some of these outlets that are making these comments, which is, I think, a great step forward in the fight against the ability for those on the left, those gatekeepers of managing and establishing the liberal egalitarian orthodoxy that pervades all of our lives. The fact is Breitbart, you know, you go back to Andrew Breitbart in that famous video where he, he basically said to the, to a lot of the uh, organizations like the SPLC, the ADL, he said war, he said war at the end. And he dropped a, he dropped an F bomb. I'm not going to drop an F bomb on this 
this child for this this kid friendly show. Thank you. But um, thank you. You know, the fact is, Andrew Breitbart was a champion. He was a warrior. I had the opportunity to meet Andrew Breitbart a number of times and spend some time with him. He was a a great man. And well. Uh, I, I never had the opportunity to meet Andrew Breitbart, but I certainly do think that Steve Bannon, as you pointed out earlier, it fell into, Breitbart News fell into really very capable, capable hands, and uh, uh, Steve Bannon has really made a great thing out of it. Now, one of the amazing things to me is that when all of these unhinged accusations of anti-Semitism, white supremacy came out, what did people trot out to back up these accusations? They pointed to headlines on Breitbart News. And here are some of them, collected for our delectation by Huffington Post. Here's one. Lesbian bridezillas bully bridal shop owner over religious beliefs. Teenage boys with tits. Here's my problem with Ghostbusters. Here's another one. Trannies whine about hilarious Bruce Jenner billboard. <laughs> Another one, how Donald Trump made it cool to be gay again. Another one, Gabby Giffords, colon, the gun control movement's human shield. And uh, <laughs> then here's another one, sympathy for the devils, the plot against Roger Ailes and America. And I'll just give you one last one here. Roger Stone, colon, Huma Abedin, most likely a Saudi spy with deep, unarguable connections to global terrorist entity. And it goes on and on in exactly this tone. Now, I am at a complete loss to understand how any of these headlines, which probably Steve Bannon himself didn't even write, how does this prove the charges? How does this make him no different from David Duke? The, this, this the, only, the only headline that I ever saw that could conceivably, even in the remotely, in the, rem the most fertile imagination of a lefty, link him to some sort of anti-Semitism was a piece written by David Horowitz in which he called Irving Kristol a renegade Jew. So one Jewish writer saying another Jewish writer is a renegade Jew. I'm not even sure what that means. But this proves that Bright, that uh, Breitbart and, by extension, Steve Bannon is an anti-Semite. This stuff is just round the bend. If you deviate from the liberal orthodoxy on any issue, homosexuality, transgenderism, what Steve Saylor calls World War T, uh, automatically you're a white supremacist. Now, one thing that uh, I have seen a lot of people attack Breitbart for is they had a section called Black Crime where they talked about stories that the mainstream media refuses to cover. And you and I know that, you know, if you watch your your nightly newscast, uh, you know, from your affiliate ABC, NBC, CBS, and whatever city you, you live in the suburbs of, the only crime you'll see is committed by blacks. Now, it, it, for, for, for us, it's, it's, um, it's a redundancy to, to put those two together. But Breitbart got a lot of traffic. And guess what? Sites like The Blaze, which Glenn Beck, who called Steve Bannon a terrifying man, The Blaze did a lot of this, of this race baiting to get clicks. They would do the same type stories as well. Now, if I could talk briefly about Glenn Beck, Jared, the media thought that Trump was going to be trounced. Remember when Hillary Clinton said, why am I not up 50 points? They were preparing for a post-Trump GOP where all of those ideas that he was championing had been discredited, where Breitbart was tarred and feathered as a racist site, where Steve Bannon went down with flames. His vision of the country went down with flames when the righteous Americans rose up and they, and they said no to Donald Trump's quote-unquote dark vision. That's why you saw that weird New Yorker profile of Glenn Beck where he said, I have a newfound respect for, for Barack Obama. You know, I'm, I'm saddened by all that's happening. And now, what do you do with Glenn Beck? Because he's <laughs> lost all shred of legitimacy for conservatives because he's been attacking and attacking and attacking. The same thing with Eric Erickson over at Red State and the resurgent. They've used all their capital and they've lost, in some cases, 75% of their audience if you look at Alexa ratings and traffic. They've lost all that because they wanted to be on the right side of history. Well, speaking of losing credibility, it seems to me that uh, the people who are accusing Steve Bannon of anti-Semitism, naked white supremacy, etc., etc., they have emptied their vocabulary now. The, the dictionary is, is, uh, is clean. What are they going to call somebody who really does have a racial consciousness? They've all said it all now. So if David Duke, which is impossible, of course, if David Duke were to be appointed to a job in the Trump administration, absolutely out of the question, what 
possible words are they going to come up with that are any different? They have no idea how much this reduces any kind of faith that people would have in their judgment. If they go round the bend and can't tell the difference between David Duke and Steve Bannon, they just can't tell the difference between anything and anything. Well, I got to say, I wasn't watching much of the coverage on election night of our of our cultural commissars who are the net, uh, on the nightly news, uh, you know, MSNBC, CNN. You know, Van Jones called what just happened a white lash. I'm sure you saw the, the clip. I did. The Media Research Center. I, I do want to. I do want to ask that you guys go watch this. They did a best of liberal media figures' reactions to Trump's victory, and the the biracial South African Trevor Noah, who's on Comedy Central, said. Quote, I'm literally shitting in my pants right now. You know, the left, they, they are so unhinged right now. If you watch these reactions, they legitimately, Jared, they legitimately believe that Donald Trump is a racist of some sort, though he is the furthest thing from that. He's an American nationalist. Yeah. And, you know, then with the announcement that Steve Bannon was going to be a part of it, they've just doubled down on this hate. And, and yeah. you are so right about that. That I mean, it's almost a blank slate now when it comes to what word can we create now? How can we create some sort of chart right. to connect all this? It's like a detective I, uh, I, I, case. I think, I think you touched on an interesting point. As soon as you deviate on one little bit of the liberal orthodoxy, then they assume you have deviated across the board. So if Donald Trump says, I want to send every illegal immigrant back where he came from, the only reason he could possibly want to think that is he must hate Hispanics. And if he hates Hispanics, he must hate blacks. He must hate women. He must hate Jews. He must hate homosexuals. So all you need to do is step off the reservation one foot, and then they feel fully justified in making all of these completely crazy accusations. I don't think that's that much of a caricature. I really do believe that that's the way most liberal minds operate. They have this completely sloppy, they think they're connecting the dots. What they're really doing is just utter fantasy. In any case, uh, aside from Steve Bannon, uh, another important thing that happened this week was the banning of the Twitter accounts, uh, most notably that of Richard Spencer, who runs NPI, but also a good dozen other people that are associated with what's going to be called the alt-right. This, to me, is a very, very ominous development because it reflects Twitter's new rules whereby, for practically any reason, anyone can complain about a Twitter user, and it looks as though Twitter is going to decide to take unilateral action, no warning, no nothing, boom, banned. This is very serious. Well, before we started this conversation, you noted correctly that a private company should have the right to discriminate. You know, I believe... That freedom of association is the only freedom that matters. If you don't have that, you live under tyranny. Now, you correctly noted, however, that Twitter, Facebook, and these social media sites, Google even, they represent public utilities at this point. They have demolished their competition. There is no competition. Look, a shout out to Gab. Gab is a great site. I'm on there. You can follow me at SBPDL. I think the New Century Foundation American Renaissance is going to be on there soon. However, on Gab, you do not have the ability to interact with celebrities, journalists, personalities that you would never in a million years have the opportunity to. The fact is social media won the election for Donald Trump. The fact is that people who were on there, they were active, they were doing memes, they were doing videos, they were engaging people, and they were showing that there was something powerful happening. This this goes back to June of 2015 when Donald Trump made his announcement, and you saw all these various individuals start creating videos. I mean, a shout out to the Can't Stump the Trump videos. All the people who just independently of each other created this, and, and you know, Richard Spencer. My belief real quick is this, Jared. The left thought they were going to crush Donald Trump, and they already had planned to start doing the culling. They had to, to, I believe the word Richard correctly used was digital executions of the personalities who had made Trump possible. Richard was one of those main people uh, who had become the face of the alt-right. And, you know, unfortunately, the Silicon Valley went all in to stop Donald Trump. And now that he's president, they're going to do everything to go all in to stop those who made Trump possible from having a voice. Well, if I, as I have often said, uh, orthodoxies lash out in the most vicious way as they die. <laughs> and the egalitarian orthodoxy is under threat in the most serious manner 
for decades, decades, and I think that they are going to lash out like never before. The people in universities, they're going to think to themselves, my gosh, we didn't brainwash these people hard enough. The people in the corporate executive suites are going to say, we didn't punish people enough when they got off the reservation. All of this is going to get more and more horrible, whereas at the same time, people are going to react to those excesses and realize what sort of society we really, we really live in. I see the collision coming in a very, very substantial way, all of which being presided over by a Trump presidency will make this a fascinating four years. We can't get into it, but to accentuate your point, Grubhub CEO saying, if you voted for Trump, get out, get out of here. You know, the fact is universities across the country right now, Jared, are trying to give resources to these anti-Trump protests, these riots that are taking place. And let's be honest what they are. You know, we keep hearing news stories that Donald Trump supporters are going crazy. They're beating people. The one down in Louisiana Lafayette, as you noted last week, was a hoax. There's one down in Atlanta right now where a Muslim teacher in Gwinnett County, uh, she says that a, a, a anti-Muslim note was left on her desk. Well, guess what? It's coming out that... She was the person who wrote it, and she's trying to turn it into what was a teachable moment. The fact is, there have been attacks by white Marxists in Austin, Texas, on Trump supporters the other day. There were six, six Marxists were arrested. There was an attack on the New York subway by a black, black man on a Trump supporter wearing a Make America Great Again hat. There was an attack at a Boston bar. The incident in Maryland yesterday where a guy, a, a student wearing a Make America Great Again hat was attacked by his fellow students who were walking out. There is verifiable Hatred documented and videotaped of Trump supporters being attacked for, as you said, breaking apart from that orthodoxy. And go ahead. And of course, this is why we must have access to Twitter, to Facebook, to YouTube, all of these things, because the media in general are not covering these things. No. And they realize that once we have access, direct access to audiences of our own, they no longer have anything like the power they used to have. Now, we have been inquiring of the media if they are willing to condemn these arbitrary suspensions of Twitter accounts. Well, they're certainly dragging their feet because this undercuts their own power. As soon as we have access to microphones of our own, this means that they are no longer the monopoly to control the discourse in this country. But anyway, no, this is very serious business, and I hope that uh, uh, Richard Spencer and all the rest of them are reinstated, but we'll keep our fingers crossed. I thought your note was important, but I'd like to make one more point that is, for all those conservatives out there who, who might read American Renaissance and VDARE and SBPDL and you know, maybe even they might go as far to read a little Daily Stormer or some of these other sites. Mm -hmm. Guess what, guys? They're coming after fake news sites. Now they're up so upset about the way that Breitbart, Alex Jones' Infowars, um, a whole host of other sites, Gateway Pundit, Drudge Report. The fact that these sites were able to break a part of that paradigm that you're talking about, the gatekeepers in the media, they're trying now to go after fake news sites so that Google won't, won't uh, they won't show up higher on news on, on searches. And guess what? It's not just American Renaissance. It's not just VDARE. It's sites like the Media Research Center, CNS News, Town Hall. They're going to come for all of you. Now, the question is that I have for you right now is they've come for the alt-right. They've chopped the head off their access for some of their key people. Guess what, guys? At a moment's whim, they could take out Brent Bozell's Twitter account. They could take out CNS News. They could take out, they could take out Alex Jones's and Paul Joseph Watson. They could take out Donald Trump's Twitter account. Which, why haven't they? Yes. Because if he is the purveyor, if he is, quote unquote, literally Hitler, wouldn't you want to go for the source? That's right. But they can't go that far yet. That's a step too far. But that is, that is obviously where they want to yes. go. Yes. Now, uh, I'd like to talk also about some of the steps that Donald Trump can take right away to be doing very, very useful things for the country and for the people who supported him. And that is to go after these st sanctuary cities. He's been very strong on that question on the campaign. Now, there's no real legal definition as to what a sanctuary city is, but generally it's a jurisdiction that won't cooperate with U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE. 
Well, that means, for example, that they don't notify immigration officials when uh, an illegal alien is about to release from jail. Now, these are people we definitely don't want in the country. And they're going to say, no, nope, no, nope, we're not going to tell ICE. These guys might be deported, this rapist or this, uh, you know, this uh, uh, murderer, uh, mugger. No, we don't want them reported, deported. Can't have that. And the result is these people who should be booted don't come to the attention of the, of the authorities. Now, Apparently, according to the Center for Immigration Studies, which I think is a really great resource, absolutely great resource, there are over 300 such jurisdictions. They can be counties, they can be cities. I don't think there's an entire state that is a sanctuary state yet. But after the election of Donald Trump, no fewer than the following mayors of the following cities said publicly that they are not going to change their position. They are going to refuse to cooperate with the federal government. Ed Lee of San Francisco, Rahm Emanuel of Chicago, Bill de Blasio of New York, Seattle's Ed Murray, and Eric Garcetti of Los Angeles. This, will, this is going to set up a real confrontation because Donald Trump has said that if people don't cooperate with the federal government on these people who deserve to be deported, he's going to cut off federal money to them. But as you know, there are certain complications in trying to do that. Before we get to that, I just want to say this, in my opinion, is the most important aspect of the coming Trump presidency. It is an arguable that this issue is what rose Donald Trump to the top of the GOP primaries before the first, before even the first debate because of the Steinle. timing of the coincidence with the Kate Steinle murder by the illegal immigrant who had been deported multiple times right. and Donald Trump's somewhat bombastic and, you know, when he stumbled over calling Mexican illegal aliens rapists, it just happened to coincide at the right time. And, you know, what is that, uh, what's that uh, definition of success when, when luck meets preparation? Uh, it's some combination of that. I, the point is this. Donald Trump lucked into that whole situation. You know what? That became the really, you know, when, when you look at the fact who Trump was running against, they were very wishy-washy on this issue. Trump became resolute and he became, and this is why it's so exciting because you're hearing names, Jared, as, we, as we're going to get into the... Um, to the sanctuary city and the federal sanctions that could take place, the fact that a name like the Secretary of State for Kansas, Chris Kobosh, is being mentioned as the Attorney General, are you kidding me? Do you understand what's about to happen? You're about to see these city states that dominate states like Illinois, New York City, uh, Massachusetts, dominate states like California, and, and control the Electoral College of those states. And basically wash away the rural votes uh, of, of Americans who, who have been trying desperately to move away but keep getting dragged back into these politics. We are looking at a situation that on January 20th, 2017, when Donald Trump is, ele is, is actually an, um, is, uh, does the oath of office, the first thing he can do is these federal sanctions. Well, in fact, there is a federal law that says states and local governments may not prohibit or restrict officials from sharing information about a person's immigration status with the federal immigration officials. There is a law that prevents that. And so if somebody like Chris Kobach, and I think we could count on him to enforce the law, if he starts looking at that stuff seriously, unlike the way Barack Obama's appointees have done, there could be real consequences for these cities because the Supreme Court has also said that if you withhold funds from a city or from a local jurisdiction, it has to be in connection with the offense that the city has committed. In other words, if there's some sort of education-related offense, then you withhold education funds. Donald Trump can't simply say, okay, we're going to stop sending money to San Francisco unless it shapes up. On the other hand, if San Francisco is in violation of federal law, then you can turn off the spigot. And under those circumstances, those people are going to squeal and they're going to come around. To me, to me, I would imagine there are thousands of cases, not just the carrying out the enforcement of immigration law. There are thousands of 
federal and state and complicated little things about who gets welfare, who gets to be here, who, uh, which Salvadorans can stay <laughs> because of an earthquake. There are thousands of little things like that that if we have really well-intentioned, smart, energetic people in the government, <laughs> all those people are going. Those, mo- those funds are going to be turned off. There will be a major, major change so long as we have committed, hardworking, well-intentioned people in those positions. Well, it's like that great quote from Boondock Saints at the very end. Are we going to be able to keep going forward? And their father in that movie says, it's if we possess the Constitution. T- you know, to paraphrase, do we have the will? And I think that this is so exciting because you think about how many people have always said, well, if only we had states' rights, we could stand up to the federal government. Well, guess what? We have something better. We have a president now who is unapologetically pro-American. And I want to go back to what we said earlier. Donald Trump is an American nationalist. Steve Barron is an American nationalist. If you are against that, what are you doing in America? Seriously. I mean, all of, all of these people who are mad that Steve Bannon states, you know, it wants to put the interests of American first. Well, what the heck are you still doing in this country? Why are you here? Because all you're doing is trying to create the climate that exists in other countries. I mean, we're not going to have time to talk about it, but the National Football League is playing a game in Mexico City right now, Jared. And they have been warned, the Houston Texans, to stay in the hotel room, do not bring large sums of money, do not order room service, do not bring jewelry, because of just how dangerous it is in Mexico City. Well, as Ann Coulter said in Adios America, why in the hell have we allowed 20% of Mexico to move to the United States illegally and basically colonize and have, and basically have the future of our country in a vice? You know, they got their hands around our neck because they are dictating what happens. Well, guess what? Wow. Now Donald Trump is on the verge of creating a war. And, 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 and I don't mean that term loosely, Jared. You're like, this battle, you know, the fact Bill de Blasio went on TV yesterday and said, this, these are our values to defy federal law. The fact that the mayors of these other cities and the police chief of these cities, they've come out and said, well, we're not going to, we're not going to, we're not going to, we're not going to cooperate. Are you kidding me? Of course you are. And if you don't, we're going to find people who will. That's what I believe Donald Trump has the capacity to do, to change the direction of what you and I've lamented for a long time, what you've lamented and America Renaissance has lamented since 1990, since its inception. And that is what Wilmot Robertson called the dispossession of the American majority. Uh, Unquestionably. I think that all you really need to do to accomplish an enormous amount is simply look through the laws that are on the books. Just enforce the laws on the books. Uh, no, No less a liberal than Bill Clinton signed a law in 1996 called the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act. Now, isn't that a great title for a law? <laughs> According to this, illegal immigrants are simply not allowed to take appropriated funds of the United States for federal public benefits. Period. They're not allowed to do that. But this is the kind of law that uh, Eric Holder or Loretta Lynch have had absolutely no interest in enforcing. And again, if we have energetic, sharp-eyed people in the right spots, these laws will be enforced. It will make a huge, huge difference. So, uh, yes, I'm very much hoping that uh, the... Um, the sanctuary cities and sanctuary counties business will come to an end. A lot of this welfare chiseling will come to an end because in addition to what you said about uh, all of the violence and all of the corruption of Central America and Mexico moving north, Central Americans and Mexicans are the highest by far users of public welfare, even more than blacks in the United States. It's really quite astonishing. And the idea that you have to be a... Uh, a slavering, frothing white supremacist to be opposed to immigrants coming into this country and going on welfare is just nuts. This kind of American nationalism and interest in putting the American citizens before foreigners, that is what motivates Donald Trump and I believe his his entire entourage. In any case, uh, another thing that I am hoping that Donald Trump will do is kill this last-minute refugee deal (laughs) that Barack Obama has apparently worked out with the Australians. Now, I think Australia has a wonderful policy when it comes to boat people. We should have initiated a policy like this years ago, too. The Europeans 
a fortiori need to have a policy like that. What they do is they stop the boats. They say, okay, we're going to put you off on an island. In this case, they've got two islands. Hmm. Manus Island, which is part of Papua New, New Guinea. There's 800 square miles of, of Manus Island. And then another island they send them to is one called Nauru. It's an independent country. It's only eight square miles. And just uh, uh, as a sidelight, uh, Nauru is an interesting place. It has the distinction of having the highest obesity and overweight rate in the world. Hmm. 97% of men and 93% of women. Quite remarkable. In any case, uh, it has long been dependent on Australia. So Australia more or less tells it what to do. But when these, quote, boat people and alleged refugees show up, trying to get into Australia, they stop the boats and they take them to Manus and Nauru. Now, most of them are Muslims, and of the more than 3,000 people who are in these, uh, in these resettlement camps, 1,616 are said to have gone through the UN procedure to become legitimate refugees. And the idea here is that the United States, Barack Obama, has decided that they're going to let some number of them, maybe every last one of them, into the United States. On the other hand, there are going to be some, uh, some kinks along the way, as you no doubt realize. Yeah, well, I, I'm looking over. Uh, it's just stunning that Barack Obama, in his hubris and in his revenge against America, would even try and rush this through. And, and looking at, at uh, the vetting, it, it, it's not already been started. Uh, the refugees would have to be, um, uh, looking at this, they, they would not be resettled. They would not be able to be resettled before Trump gets in office. Exactly. So The vetting can take months. It can take years. And uh, even by the standards of uh, the very, very loose standards of Barack Obama, yeah. he's got to take a hard look at these people. I mean, how would it look if he rushes these people through and the next thing you know, we got some knifings, we've got some uh, uh, Christians with their heads cut off. All of these people practically are Muslims. So uh, I think the idea that uh, they're going to kind of sneak it in under the wire before yeah. Trump gets, that's obviously and clearly what they're trying to do. It's really uh, the, this, the despicable kind of thing that uh, Democrats very frequently do. Now, uh, apparently, the, the Australians have tried any number of tricks <laughs> with this stuff. They're trying, they paid $55 million to Cambodia, of all places, <laughs> to accept some of these. Well, a few of them go off and live in Cambodia. And, oh, no, we don't like Cambodia. So they can't see why. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't, can't possibly imagine why. The other place that some of them have attempted to resettle is Papua New Guinea. But no, they don't like that either. They have found that they fear for their lives in Papua New Guinea. In any case, I think this is a fascinating example of just the kind of thing that Republicans regularly attempt to do right at the last minute. The, uh, what I'm waiting to see is what kind of executive pardons uh, Barack Obama will unleash in his last days in office. They're interesting. They're interesting precedents for that too. There are interesting precedents. I want to go back to what you're talking about the refugee situation because we know that they've been the Democrats and particularly Barack Obama. They've been doing everything they can to try and ram through as many Syrian refugees still into this country. Uh, I believe the number it varies with the estimates you see between 16,000. They're all Muslim when in reality it's the Christians in Syria who really need the help and. There's an interesting correlation because we're getting warnings from DHS that there is concerns of attacks this Thanksgiving at parades and, and, and whatnot. And I'm only speculating here, but could you imagine the mandate Donald Trump will get if there is something like that? And it does come out that it was a Syrian refugee. At that point, Barack Obama should resign in shame. I, I, he won't. He no, won't. No. He won't. Of course not. You know. But I'm just pointing out that if 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 his policies have led to violent attacks on Americans. I mean, the mandate that Donald Trump has right now, it's on, it, it just got loaded in a spaceship and the rocket fuel is lit. I'm telling you folks, this is the type of stuff that elected Donald Trump. This is the type of stuff that in rural Americans, that rural Americans in these, in these areas that are been forgotten and they're laughed at uh, by, you know, people like Samantha Bee on TBS and, and all these comedians, they just laugh at Americans. They hate, you don't understand how much they hate you folks. And, the, the point is, you've got someone in the White House and his chief of and his and his senior policy advisor who know this. 
They yes. know this. And yes. that's, that should give you, as we head into the Thanksgiving season and Christmas, that should fill your heart and should make your heart grow far larger than the Grinch's heart grew in Dr. Seuss's little story. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, you know what this reminds me of, what... Uh... Um, what, Bar- what uh, Barack Obama was trying to do with these, who knows, this 1,600 uh, people from, and we don't even know where they're all from. Uh, a lot of them are Afghanistanis. Uh, they're, uh, they're, but in any case, they're almost overwhelmingly Muslim. Some of them have been sitting on these islands for two or three years. Uh, I don't suspect they've learned any uh, saleable skills in that process. Probably don't speak English. They have no trade. But... Uh, uh, Barack Obama wants them. All qualifications gonna... for a perfect American in the eyes of Obama, right? Well, there you go. <laughs> so long as they add the diversity, then uh, they're going to just be as American as all the dis- direct descendants of George Washington. But what this reminds me, uh, for old guys like me, I think back to 1996 and 2000. That's back when Clinton was doing his own uh, sort of, it was in, in this case, it was skullduggery having to do with naturalizations. And in 1996 in particular, he was worried about uh, being reelected, and uh, he put a lot of pressure on, in those days, it was the INS, Immigration Naturalization Service, in the cities of New York, Chicago, Miami, San Francisco, and Los Angeles to really rush through naturalizations as quickly as possible so that he would have more people voting for him. And as you see what the consequences were later on, later on, <laughs> when people actually looked through and found out who these new American citizens were, it was extraordinary. Yeah, the skullduggery you're talking about to create these, to naturalize these hundreds of thousands of foreigners, and coincidentally the same cities where the mayors are saying, hey, we're going to stay sanctuary. Screw you, Trump. Uh, More than 75,000 new citizens had arrest records when they applied. An additional 115,000, their fingerprints were unclassifiable for various technical reasons and were never resubmitted. And you've got to have a fingerprint analysis to be a naturalized. They just (laughs) said the hell with that. We don't need fingerprints. And and even even crazier, another 61,000 who were given citizenship with with no finger with n- another sixty one thousand were given citizenship with no fingerprints submitted at all. That's right. And only a handful of those citizenships were ever revoked. Despite the fact that seventy five thousand had arrest records, and they just rammed them through, absolutely rammed them through. This is the desperate kind of stuff that Democrats do, absolutely to cling to power. Well. It- It goes back to the idea that the franchise is force. When you vote, you are exercising force. And the Democrats' ideas, guess what? They don't really fly with your normal Americans. So as as Vidar has noted, you've got to elect new people. And giving the franchise this many people, it did allow these states where you've got a high population of rural whites still. You've got to to find a way to counteract that. That's right. And in 2000, in 2000, uh, that was the last time, uh, that was when uh, Al Gore, the fair-haired lad, was <laughs> going to be running. And they put exactly the same kind of pressure on. And here's another uh, Center for Immigration Studies report uh, on the, re- the results of what the attempts were in, the, in 2000. I'll read this because I think it's, I think it's really worth, uh, worth thinking about. Uh, CIS says, in preparation for the 2000 elections, INS agents in the district offices were directed to relax the testing for English. Complete every interview within 20 minutes and ensure that all applicants pass the civics test by continuing to ask questions until an applicant got a sufficient number right. Keep asking questions. Sometimes it was necessary to ask 20 or 25 questions before four or five were answered correctly. In other words, the INS was under orders. Do whatever it took. Whatever it took to get these people naturalized so they can vote. This is, this is the attitude that our opponents have towards American citizenship, which is supposed to be something, I always thought, of some significant value. But for these people, citizenship is nothing but a tool to get people who are going to vote for their guys in the position to do the voting. It's just extraordinary. Now, this kind of thing, this kind of thing is for sure going to come to a screeching halt under a Trump presidency. Well, it's the reason why Robert Heinlein wrote in Starship Troopers that the social democracies of the 20th century would fail because citizenship, what did citizenship mean? It basically meant that people would have the right to vote in whatever they wanted to without the consequences of how you actually got it, without toil, without striving, without, without sacrifice, that you could just make citizens willy-nilly and the consequences would never be felt. 
Well, I hate to say it, guys, the consequences of the social democracies and rabid egalitarianism, it has a one-syllable name, and it's Trump. (laughs) That is the consequences, and he's just an American nationalist. But as, if we could sum up what we've talked about here, Mm -hmm. what do these words mean anymore that are being tossed around at Steve Bannon, at Trump, at Trump supporters? What happens when you start to... um, ban people that you disagree with, that you vehemently say shouldn't have a voice on social media, and then you decide, well, let's not stop there. Let's just keep going and and cut the knees out of all these other organizations that would, if they found out that people were associated with this, they would viciously uh, fire and and cut off immediately. Let's be honest there. They are are just as, some of these conservative organizations are are just as rigid when it comes to um, policing their own uh, personnel as the left is. But my point is this. Trump changed things. And the media, they they understand this. And and Jared wrote an amazing article that was cross-posted over at VDARE the other day. I believe you talked about uh, just how crazy the response has been to to Trump's election. Yes. Well, uh, the way I put it is they thought that by creating a character of Donald Trump as this Frankenstein monster racist, they were going to stampede millions of voters into the Hillary camp. They failed. (laughs) And now they're stuck with this notion of Donald Trump as a seething, hang em high white supremacist. And how they're going to ever back away from that, I don't know. But uh, we'll see. And it is possible that despite the fact that Donald Trump is certainly not one of us, it may be that he is open to some of our ideas and we will continue to make our podcasts, make our videos, so long as we can post them on such places as YouTube and not get cut off the knees, as is happening increasingly now. And we will hope that our ideas will get to the highest levels in the Trump White House and we are more optimistic now than we have been in many decades. Something tells me all of what you just said might just happen. (laughs) We'll hope so. Okay, well, great. Thanks for having you on. Always a pleasure, and uh, we'll see you next week. Pleasure's all mine.